Well, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, it says this. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Well, let's look closely at these verses from the book of Timothy. As a reminder, Timothy is a young pastor. The apostle Paul took him under his wing, so to speak. He wrote this letter to him telling him how to pastor a church. It's a letter that was not only meant for Timothy, though, it was meant for all Christians for all time. And so look at that first line of verse 17. It says, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited. There are rich Christians, there are poor Christians, and there's everything in between. The Apostle Paul uh, right here is addressing rich Christians, wealthy Christians, Christians who are doing well financially. And there weren't a lot of rich Christians in the day when this letter was written. There are now, but there wasn't then. But nevertheless, Paul wanted to address those who were wealthy. Now, it's important to know there's nothing inherently sinful or wrong with having wealth. Many of God's people in the Bible had a lot of wealth. For instance, King David. King David was a very wealthy man. And, and the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. Abraham was a very wealthy man. And God made him the father of many nations, father of Israel. Job was a very wealthy man, and God, God called Job a righteous man. Many theologians believe that the Apostle Peter was a wealthy man, and Peter was perhaps the most known and most famous of all the apostles. And so it's not wrong or sinful in itself to be wealthy. When a person has a lot of wealth, in, in many ways it can be a blessing. Uh, wealthy people have the ability to, to really give. They have an ability to really help others uh, in ways that someone with less wealth maybe couldn't. But at the same time, in many ways, a wealthy Christian does have to be careful. Paul, uh, he writes this warning because wealth can bring out sin in a person. The, the Bible here warns rich people for a reason. The Bible warns rich people to not be conceited. And it, it is easy to become proud and it's easy to become conceited if you're very rich. It's easy for a rich person to place themselves above, above others. Now, it doesn't have to be this way. I have met many, many Christians over the years who are wealthy and they have at the same time been very humble, not conceited at all. But nevertheless, we should take heed of this passage because it, it is the inspired word of God. And if the Bible is warning those who are rich not to be conceited, then there must be a real danger of that happening of conceitedness going along with riches. Well, what does that word conceit actually mean? Well, we can get a good idea by looking at what other, looking at what other versions say. If we look at the English Standard Version, 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. The New Living Translation says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud. The King James Version says, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. And so from these different versions, we see that the word conceited can be haughty, proud, or high-minded. To be haughty is to be, well, I don't even like this word, but it's, kinda, it's to be kind of stuck up. You've heard of people saying that word, stuck up is to think that you're better than others, is to look at other people in a condescending way. Uh, haughty people tend to look down on others. Haughtiness is like snobbishness. I have seen this characteristic in some people in my lifetime, but not very often. And truthfully, the wealthy Christians that I have known, I, I've, not, I've not seen this at all. But it's still something we need to guard against. In Romans 12, 16, it says, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. A person who is wealthy also has to be careful to guard against pride. 
A person can get proud thinking how they've made such an achievement to attain all of this wealth, and no doubt it is often a great accomplishment. But a, but a Christian needs to remember, where did they get their talent to accomplish what they've accomplished? Where did they get the ability to make all this wealth? In 1 Corinthians 4, 7, it says, For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? All of the talents that any of us have in anything, we receive them, including the talent of making wealth. It came from God, and so we need to guard against pride. We should be thankful for our accomplishments, thankful to God for the gifts he's given us. Thankful but not proud. Our verse says, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited. And so we've got to guard against conceitedness, pride, haughtiness, high-mindedness. We see in the Bible a good example of a rich person with a wrong heart attitude about his wealth. If you have your Bibles, look at Luke 16, 19, or listen as I read it. Luke 16, 19. This is written in a parable form, and so many theologians believe this is a parable, and some the theologians believe this is actually referring to an actual person. We don't know for sure. Um, either way, if it's a parable or not, all the principles apply. Luke 16, 19 says, now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. This man was rich. The very first words of this parable are, now there was a rich man. This rich man habitually dressed in purple and fine linen. He had the money to buy clothes that were dyed in purple. This was something, in the days of Jesus, this was something that only the richest people could do. A king could dress in purple, or an extremely wealthy man could dress in purple, no one else. It was expensive. He dressed in purple. He dressed in fine linen every day. The Bible says that he lived in joyous splendor. And so this was a very wealthy man. But there was a poor man who was laid at his gate, the very fact that he had a gate in those days to have a gate also meant you were very wealthy. There was a poor man who was laid at his gate. This man was so poor that he was unable to even afford to buy food. The Bible says he was just laid at the gate. Someone had to put him there. He wasn't even healthy enough to get there on his own. He was laid at the gate hoping just to get the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. He was poor financially. He was poor in health. The Bible says he was covered in sores. And he must have been in really bad shape. He must have been very sickly, very weak. He was, he was so weak. The Bible says that the, the dogs would come and lick his sores, and there he would lay. He wasn't even strong enough to shoo away the dogs. He would just lay there, and the dogs would lick his sores. The rich man had to be aware of this poor man, because he was right at his gate. It wasn't like he was hiding somewhere. He was right at his gate. But he didn't do anything to help him. It's very likely that he was high-minded, proud, haughty. He was a conceited man. And he most likely looked down on those who were poor. He most likely thought of himself as being superior to them. He looked on them with condescension. The man in this parable sounds like a person who would be annoyed at the beggar by his gate rather than be concerned about the beggar at his gate. Verse 22 continues. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue. For I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things. And likewise, Lazarus, 
bad things, but now he's being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send them to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. The rich man in this parable was concerned about how he dressed, how he ate, how he lived in joyous splendor. But the one thing that he wasn't concerned about was loving his neighbor. It was more important for this man to be dressed in purple linen than to feed the poor starving man at his gate. His focus was very much on himself. He was living a high life. But in the end, he didn't fare well. Not at all. Not at all. Now understand, it's not inherently wrong to be wealthy. But it is inherently wrong to be conceited. It is inherently wrong to be high-minded or proud or haughty about being rich. It's wrong to be selfish while being wealthy and not caring about others who are in need. Had this man been a man of God, he still could have been rich. David was rich. Abraham was rich. Job was rich. Had this man been a man of God, he still could have been rich. But he would have done things differently. He would have used his wealth to serve God. He wouldn't have ignored a beggar at his gate. He would have took care of the beggar at his gate. This man didn't go to hell because he was rich. He went to hell because he was a man who rejected God. And you could see it in his actions. You could see it in his life. A man of God would have never let a poor man full of sores lay at his gate without reaching out to to show him some grace and mercy. Amen? Let's look at the next phrase. Look at the... Look at 1 Timothy 6, 17 again. It says, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. There's an uncertainty to riches. Riches can come, and and just as easily they can go. In Proverbs 23, 4, it says, do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. Wealth and riches, they can come and they can go. There's an uncertainty about it. But even if a person has a lot of wealth, and even if they have it in such of a way that it is secure as, as you can make it, it's not just going to go fly away. Our verse still says, don't fix your hope on this. Don't fix your hope on it. Why is it that a person should not fix their hope on their riches? I mean, a lot of people are really pursuing riches. They're really putting their hope in it. Why should we not fix our hope on riches? Well, it's because riches can only do what they were designed to do. And what they were designed to do has its limits. Riches can purchase the things of this world. And if you have a lot of wealth, you have a lot of purchasing power. And that's, that can be a blessing. But riches can't buy love. Riches can't replace the love of a family. Riches can't make you immune to disease. Riches can't cure an incurable disease. Riches can't even buy you happiness. Wealth can't stop you from aging. Wealth can't stop you from dying. And wealth certainly cannot buy salvation. Wealth and riches, they can be a blessing, but the Bible says... Don't place your hope there. Riches can't deliver you. Riches can't deliver what matters most. Our hope needs to be placed in Jesus Christ. Amen? Our hope needs to be placed in Christ. Our verse says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Back during the Depression It's interesting to read the history. There was many, many wealthy people. And all of a sudden, when the stock market crashed, all their wealth was gone. And if you look at history, 
you'll see where there was wealthy people who were living the high life. Suddenly they were jumping off of buildings. They had placed their hope in the wrong place, amen? And when their hope was gone, they just lost it. We need to place our hope in Christ. Our blessings, the things that bring us true joy in life, these blessings come from God. It must be a terrible disappointment for a person who has set their hope on riches, who has dedicated their life to becoming rich, and they finally succeed. They've gone through many decades in life, and they finally succeeded. They have all this wealth. And then they realize they're, they're nearing death, and their riches cannot make them young again. Their riches can't add another minute to their life. They're getting old. They're going to soon leave this world, and all they have is their riches. Their riches can't deliver. Psalm 49, 16 says, Do not be afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not descend after him. Though while he lives, he congratulates himself, and though men praise you when you do well for yourself, he shall go to the generation of his fathers. They will never see the light. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. Our hope, Christian, is, to, is Christ, amen? Our hope is Christ, not riches. Now look at the next verse, verse 18. It says this, Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. So Timothy didn't ignore those who were rich. There weren't many people who were rich in his day. There really wasn't. But nevertheless, there were a few, and Timothy wasn't going to ignore them. He was told to instruct them. He said those who are rich, he told them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, to be ready to share. And these instructions really actually apply to all of us, don't they? We should all be doing good. We should all be rich in good works. We should all be generous. We should all be ready to share. But Paul is telling Timothy here to especially give these instructions to those who were wealthy. The rich man in the parable who dressed in purple and fine linens, who lived in joyous splendor, he wasn't following the instructions to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, to be ready to share. He wasn't doing that at all. Instead, he, instead of loving his neighbor, he ignored his neighbor. Instead of having some concern for his neighbor, he was only concerned for himself. He needed the instructions to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, to be ready to share. He needed Christ. He let his riches become his God. He let his riches become his life. And this is one of the dangers of having wealth. Now before we go any further, know this, all of us here in America are perhaps the richest people in the world. And while this sermon is addressing rich people, it's easy for us to think about someone who's way wealthier than us and kind of think, well, maybe today we're reading someone else's mail and that this really isn't for us. But just think about this. Here, we live in America. We go in our house, and we have a roof over our head. We have windows and walls that hold the cold out and hold the heat out. We can turn a little dial and air conditioning comes on or heat comes on. We can go into our kitchen and we can turn a knob and cold water comes out or hot water comes out. We have comfortable beds. We have comfortable furniture. We want to go someplace and we get in a car and we drive down a nice road, a soon-to-be nice road. <laughs> right? But we have cars. They had to walk in those days or ride a horse or ride in some kind of a wagon they didn't have running water. They didn't have heat. If they wanted to warm up, they had to build a fire. If they wanted to eat something, I mean, we can go to a restaurant. We can open our cupboard. We can pull out a can of something, open it up, throw it on a stove, just turn a knob, the heat comes on. You know the richest people back in the days of Jesus that they were addressing? They didn't have any of these things. The poorest people in our country today are way richer than the richest people that those, in those days as far as having luxury and convenience. It's not even close. 
Not even close. I mean, think about how many pairs of shoes you have in your closet. You probably don't want to think about that. Think about how many, how many clothes we have. Think about, just think about what we really have. And, and besides all that, I mean, we, we, and we have enough wealth that we can buy toys even. So I just want to, the reason I'm saying all that is not, it's not inherently wrong to be rich. But I'm just saying as Americans, we are. So this message is to all of us. It isn't just for the super wealthy. We are the super wealthy when you look at the rest of the world. It's not inherently wrong to be rich. What's wrong is to be conceited, to be haughty, to be proud, to be selfish. The Bible tells us, and it's telling all of us, to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous, to be ready to share. Why do you suppose God gives Christians wealth? I think we could make a case that God gives Christians wealth just so they have a special ability to do extra good works, to be extra generous, to really share, to really bless others. Now here's something you probably already know, but if not, you need to know it. This is, this is some really, really wonderful, wonderful doctrine I'm gonna read right now. Christian, when you're generous, when you're loving someone, when you're helping someone, when you're blessing a person in need, when you go to someone and you're concerned about that person and when you share what you have with that person, you just some way, somehow, you're helping them, you're blessing them, you're there for them. When you're doing that, whatever blessing you're given, whatever goodness you're doing, whatever gift you're sharing, the Bible says that you're doing it to Christ himself. And that's amazing. Listen to these amazing verses. This is an amazing truth. Matthew 25, 34. Here is the, the setting here, the context. This is the day of judgment. This is people standing before the throne. This is the day of judgment. And this is what, this is what the Lord says. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. Think about that. I was thirsty. And you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. And you invited me in. Naked. And you clothed me. I was sick. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? And, and when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison? And come to you. When did that happen? The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. That is amazing, isn't it? That is amazing. Christian, think of how you are really serving. Think of who you're really serving. That's amazing, amazing doctrine. Now look at verse 19. We'll close in just a moment. Verse 19 says, Storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. When we do good, when we're rich in good works, when we're generous, when we, we use the wealth God's given us to bless others, the Bible says that we're storing up the treasure of a good foundation for the future. We're taking a hold of that which is life indeed. Well, what does this mean? We know we're not saved by good works. We're saved by God's grace. 
We're not saved by anything we do, but by what Jesus Christ has done for us. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ, not by riches. So what does it mean when the Bible says, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed? Well, this verse could sound like it's saying a rich person can be generous and rich in good works, and by so doing they can store up for themselves a a good foundation for the future, almost like it's saying a rich person by his generosity could gain eternal life. But that's not what it's saying. Eternal life can't be earned. It can't be bought. It's, it's a free gift. And it can only come through faith in Christ. No matter how rich you are or how poor you are, it only comes through faith in Christ. So what does it mean when the Bible says storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future? so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Well, the New International Version says it like this. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This verse doesn't say we're saved by our good works, but it does say that as a person who is rich, as he practices doing good, as he's rich in good works, as he's generous... He's laying up a treasure in heaven. He's laying up a treasure for the coming age. And he's taking a hold of the life, that eternal life which he already has. He's taking a hold of it. In other words, he's setting his mind there. He's living for the eternal life, not for this life. Christian, we're not saved by our works. But once we are saved, as we do good, as we love others, as we bless others, as we help others, as we're rich in good works, as we're living how Christ wants us to live, the Bible says we are storing up a treasure in heaven, a treasure that awaits the coming age. And we're taking a hold of that eternal life. It's not how we're earning it. We didn't earn it, but we're taking a hold of it. We're living for that life to come rather than simply living for the here and now. The Bible says set your mind on things above, amen? Amen. Matthew 6, 19 says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Christian, the greatest investment that you can make, the greatest investments are eternal investments. The greatest treasure you can store up are treasures in heaven. Use the wealth that you have now to do good for God's kingdom. Use the wealth that you have now to be rich in good works, to be generous. Be ready for the Lord's sake to be generous, to be sharing, to bless others with what you have. Let me read through this verse one more time and we'll close. Paul said to Timothy under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he says to us as well, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the many blessings that you've given us, especially the blessing of salvation, the blessing of Christ. Lord, while we are on this earth for this short time, help us, Lord, to be doing good works, to be rich in good works, to be sharing with others, to be blessing others, to be loving others for the sake of Christ. Help us to know that when we do these things, we're doing it for Christ and to Christ. Lord, help us to walk as lights, lights of Christ shining in this world. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.